Welcome to the season two of the Smart and Sustainable City podcast. This is Pierre Mirles. A big thank you to all of you listeners from around the world. This show is now in the chart of the top Smart City podcasts. In this season, based on your request, we extend our format. We dig deeper in some Smart City topics. In this episode, we talk to Alan Marcus, the Chief Digital Officer of Planet Smart City a global leader in smart, affordable housing. Alan and I talk about the need for affordable housing powered by smart and sustainable design and smart technology that powers communities to live better together. I'm Alan Marcus. I am the Chief Digital Officer at uh, Planet Smart City, and uh, we build a smart and affordable housing. Alan, w where are you based? I live in... Uh, you know, a typical suburban uh, village just outside of New York City. In fact, uh, just uh, not more than 15 miles or about 20 uh, kilometers from the city center. Um, I live on the sea, so at least I get to uh, walk out of my house and get uh, some fresh air and see the wonderful spring that uh, always happens here in New York. But it's, uh, it's difficult. It's, it's, a, it's a good test of our society. It's a good test of character. Yes. Alan, please tell us your experience with cities and tell us what got you to where you are now. Okay, so um, I, uh, I worked in Silicon Valley, a number of technology companies. The, uh, the most uh, number of years I spent anywhere was with Cisco. Uh, and that was both in their headquarters in California, uh, but also in Asia Pacific and, uh, and in Europe at various points along that trajectory. And one of the interesting things I learned then uh, was really the power that technology has on people, how, how it can change uh, outcomes uh, in some very profound ways. In, in Asia, when I, I moved there in the late 90s, uh, there was, uh, you know, then, uh, which looks quite small compared to what happened in 2008, but a, a fairly good uh, currency crisis, a liquidity challenge. Uh, that started in Korea and Thailand, and we saw currencies drop, uh, and we saw a lot of companies uh, disinvest out of out of Asia. Um, and Cisco uh, was one that continued to invest, and so we were lucky in that respect. Uh, but kind of as as we came out of that, uh, the the companies, the communities, uh, were in a great need to upgrade uh, to get ready for you know what was going to become you know the new millennium and the new economic. Uh, Uh, digital economic world that, that we now all take for granted. Um, and that included how to bring technology to people. Uh, and going into communities in Southeast Asia, uh, where I lived in Singapore, in, uh, in uh, go to Indonesia, Malaysia, and really look at and understand and appreciate how people lived and how technology could make a difference. And then advising with companies and governments on how to, to improve lives. So I, I would say that's kind of maybe where my start came. Leaving Silicon Valley for the World Economic Forum opened my eyes up to what policy uh, really means, what, uh, what it really means to talk about impact, social impact, environmental impact, and how do you create a balance between being a for-profit company and, and wanting to actually participate and be a good citizen in, in terms of community building and social impact. And we worked on a number of things there uh, within uh, the forum that included, you know, environmental impact. Uh, yes, okay, uh, digital as we're doing uh, this interview. I don't need to fly on a plane. We don't need to meet. That saves, uh, you know, uh, carbon emissions. Okay, those are some obvious things. But even within the tech community where we think, okay, we can help other industries, we were creating bigger emissions. And so how do we reduce that while still being an efficiency curve for, for others. You know, that was one example. We looked a lot at the whole notion of information as a currency, as, as a, uh, an asset class, and what did that do in terms of privacy and security? So it changed fundamentally the way I certainly look at how people engage with uh, technology, how people engage with business, and how business and government and people, and, and I keep coming back to that kind of uh, people centricity, how we engage together to, to enrich and better, better our lives. So when I left the forum after uh, 10 years, I was really looking for an opportunity 
that could kind of take my Silicon Valley background and take kind of this policy, uh, social engagement experience I've just, uh, I just went through. And can I find a place where I can bring them together and really, uh, uh, you know, operate or, or execute, not just in theory, but, you know, on the ground. And, you know, as I was uh, out there looking, uh, Planet Smart City came along. And when I say, you know, working on the ground, they really mean it, right? Because it starts with digging in the earth and putting in infrastructure uh, and building homes and, and houses or buildings. Homes and communities are where people live and where people engage and where people, uh, you know, socialize. And that really became the, the opportunity for me to appreciate what, what this represents. Alan, before we dig further into your current uh, focus with Planet Smart City, I'm curious about the transition that you've seen in cities and, and your career really represents that. I have seen a trend toward the recognition that user centricity, people centricity, matters. So I, I, I feel I have seen a trend. I've seen uh, people debate issues with that in mind. I don't know that I feel we've made as much stride in that as, as I certainly hope we will going forward. Have you felt that technology has evolved over time when initially smart city smart city technology was all about measuring the environment and sensing what was going on? And it's still doing that, uh, but it's increasingly connecting the citizens between themselves and connecting the city and the citizens together. Yeah. So, I mean, so if, if we really go back to, to the late 90s, where I think kind of smart city thinking, even if it wasn't always called that started, it was just about connecting, right? It was about bringing technology into cities and the richer cities of the world uh, were, you know, first movers and trying to do this. I mean, Singapore, where I lived, already had smart roads, right? They, they had the notion of um, uh, congestion pricing, right? And, and gates and things, you know, as you, as you drove through that automatically read to the, the RFAD tag that you had in your car. That was in the 90s, right? We, we think this is a marvel of technology today, but that was already happening back then uh, in the late 90s. So uh, rich cities were able to just bring in technology to do some very interesting things but it was about the technology. It was just about connecting people and connecting services and trying to think like, if this helped me in the enterprise, I can do it in, in the city. Um, I think we've evolved quite away from that and recognize smart is not always about technology. It's about fundamentally changing the way we do things and taking it from a top down kind of structure, which is largely how we as a world have operated for the last 400 years and start thinking of a bottom up. So when I talk about user centricity, I really mean that paradigm shift, bringing the power back to the individuals and allowing them to kind of drive that change. And so smart isn't just because, oh, okay, you're Wi-Fi connected or you know, you've got 5G now. Yes, that can add some interesting smart technology, but smart means you know, the way I operate and live my life is in a much more effective way. I've got more parkland in a way that I can use it. The roads are more adapted to my lifestyle, right? These are the kinds of things that, uh, that I think change the way we think about smart. You know, if I go back 50, 60 years, I built big motorways across countries because I wanted to move a lot of goods by, by truck. And it was all focused on how business thought in that way. Now, if I want to build communities, I'm not thinking about how to connect them to motorways. Maybe I'm thinking about how to connect them to rail or how to build local manufacturing, how to source more locally and not, you know, capitalize on, on scale where I put big factories somewhere. There's a lot of change that happens when you think user centricity coming up. So I do think we're moving in that direction. I, I just don't feel uh, we've been able to reconcile the, the power the individual now has because of technology against the way we've, we've created infrastructure and governance models and, uh, it, it, based upon past paradigms. So we're in that kind of transition, and that creates a whole lot of the polarization we're seeing. You now work for an organization, a, a company that's called Planet Smart City. Tell us a little more about uh, what you guys do. So Planet Smart City is a, uh, a company that focuses on building communities. 
let me just start with, with that simple uh, premise, right? What is a community? It's a place where people live uh, and work and engage with each other. That, that's what, when we say community, what we mean. In order to bring them together in that community, it means having proper infrastructure, you know, so access to technology, certainly uh, internet, uh, communications, good uh, power, infrastructure, water, you know, healthy drinking water, these sorts of things. They need infrastructure. So we build infrastructure. They need a quality home. We're not talking about, you know, they have to be big mansions and fancy with, you know, smart lighting and smart thermostats. They just have to be a quality home that protects them from the environment, that stands, that gives them a sense of space that they own and they, you know, decorate and make it, make it their own. So we build homes. We build homes in gardens, a house. We build homes as apartments uh, in, in towers. Uh, and, then, uh, and then third, we provide ongoing services that help people continue to engage with each other, uh, continue to build uh, a model of community that allows them to create something that's unique to the, their needs, to how they live, how they work, how they operate. And we bring in the kinds of programs that are necessary for them, help uh, partially designed by them, that can bring them forward in the new smart you know, economic world that we, we all want to build. So that, that's kind of who, who we are. I see that you're active in Italy, that you're active in Brazil. You recently announced that you're starting ventures in India. In a lot of those markets, what's really important for housing is affordable housing. Tell us a little more about how you build affordable housing. Right. So I thank, thank you for that question, because that, that is really the crux of the market we're going after. Um, a lot of companies are building smart. A lot of people are doing amazing things. Um, we're focusing on a particular demographic that, that uh, most call the affordable housing market. It's a big market globally, uh, around 300, 350 billion, depends on who, who you look at from that analysis. It's a big market. Um, and there are countries that have abnormally large gaps in this affordability. Brazil and India are, are good examples of, of these large gaps. Um, we don't define what affordability is. We let the markets define that. But what we're talking about is people who have jobs, who work. Um, we're not talking about social housing. We're talking about people who can qualify for a home, whether it's a rental or an acquisition, a, a purchase, um, and can't find the kind of home that is of quality within a community that's safe and secure and access to transportation and other services that they can afford. So that's how we define affordability and many countries have uh, schemes around that. So the affordability in Brazil, in a, as an example, is around a scheme that the Brazilian government calls Mina Casa Mina Vida, which means my house, my life. Uh, and within that scheme, uh, uh, people, working people can qualify for um, uh, special uh, interest rates and other programs in the, in, the, uh, in the opportunity to purchase a home as long as the home meets certain uh, criteria, costs certainly being one of them. So we're building to that criteria to allow people to come in and, and buy and purchase. So in, uh, Brazil is following a model like that. In India, where we're uh, just announced in the Pune uh, area of Maharashtra state, one of their big affordability challenges is new college graduates, you know, and, and other uh, skilled labor that are now moving to the Pune area because it's growing, one of the fastest growing cities in the world. And we're building townships, uh, you know, uh, large suburban, if you will, type communities around Pune, the city. Uh, India is putting a lot of effort around that. And we... Uh, are going to be one of those builders. Here, you know, again, these people are coming in, they, they're getting a good job. It's a first job in most cases, uh, or it's, a, it's a, a good skilled labor job in a market they don't know coming from some other part. And they're looking for a safe, you know, quality, you know, a house that's, uh, that's going to engage them with people that are similar to themselves. You know, new graduates, skilled labor, uh, and, and so, again, focusing on that kind of, of part of the affordable market. In Italy, it's more about rental properties. 
it's it's more about uh, helping people who who uh, you know live in in some of the poor sections of of the cities within Europe and within Italy particularly, and really looking at how to renovate and revamp some of these communities with new services, a new smartification uh, that we can partner with builders in making that happen. Alan, it, help me understand how do you reconcile affordable housing and making habitat accessible to uh, this population and technology, which has the perception of being expensive. Is technology a way to keep the cost down or is it a marginal cost on top of the housing? Right. Uh, good question. So uh, three, uh, three dimensions. One, a process. The, the, um, the way we build and construct is, is unique processes to our, our, ourselves and that any builder might say the same thing. But our processes are allowing us to build at a higher quality for the same cost of materials that everyone else does. So how we build things and the processes and tools we use gives us a unique advantage in terms of speed and in terms of scale, which brings the second dimension in, scale. In order to hit the kind of target market we need to build at scale, a thousand units at a time uh, kinds of properties. So not you know, a building that's maybe uh, 30 or 40 apartments or a small complex of 300 or 400, you know, we're looking at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 unit kinds of homes. At that scale, to add some additional technology, amateurize across that many units creates a tiny fraction of a cost increase. We can take the speed of sale, which now improves dramatically when you offer these features, and the cost of sale, which shrinks as the speed improves, we can take that cost and put it back into the infrastructure, which allows us to build even more features. So in the end, our total cost from, uh, from build uh, to sale actually is the same as most of our competitors. And we add these additional features. As a base, that kind of technology then can be used to generate services. The services in the post-sales model, which is where I leave for Planet, this allows us to start thinking in terms of how to engage people, how to get them into the community and onto the platform. As we build more and more access and more and more engagement, I get more and more information about them, which allows me now to tailor programs, both impact programs and revenue generating programs, specifically tailored to their needs because of the unique a relationship we can now build with them uh, through a digital uh, interface. So this gives us a unique competency that's very difficult to find elsewhere. Right. Alan, you're the chief digital officer of Planet Smart City. And it seems from what you describe that you are not only connecting the city, but connecting the citizens. And enabling that engagement between the citizen and the city and enabling that connection between the citizen uh, themselves. Is there a sense of community that emerges from the districts that you're building? Uh, uh, really from the start, there's a sense of community. So I, I, I'll use an example now. Uh, in Laguna in Brazil, in the state of Sierra, our first big project, People are coming uh, from, you know, other Mina Casa Mina Vida communities. They may be coming from favelas. Uh, they're coming from rural lands and they're coming to this community for the first time. Uh, and they can't believe what they see in terms of quality, the landscape, this sort of thing. But here's kind of the interesting part that answers your question. They have never had any say in their community. They've either been in a favela, which might be run by a gang or something that sets the rules or they're in some community where they don't engage with each other and everyone's in there for themselves. Here, they're already starting to work together to form a community association, uh, something they don't even know what it means and, and what power they really have. And they're starting to now attest and experiment as a community working together, working with us as, as we continue to build out this property on what are the features that make sense? What are the services we want to do? Uh, how, how do we 
uh, create the right kind of environment for the community as people move in. So that citizenry starts to get a say in what's happening. This is quite unique for them. And they're doing it with people they've never really met before. They're starting to understand who they are. A one woman uh, was quoted saying, look, I come from kind of the rural lands. I, I've got this accent that people immediately dismiss me because of where I'm from. But here, I have an equal say at the table. Here, I'm, I'm able to communicate that I'm not some you know, country bumpkin, to use my, my metaphor, uh, metaphorical uh, term, not hers. I'm not you know, some rural land person. I, I'm an equal at the table, and I've got a lot to contribute. And when they start to see that, they start to realize, hey, I've got something really interesting here that, that I didn't have where I lived before. I wasn't accepted like this. But when you can engage people and you can give them a say and you can, you can have them communicate with each other in a way that shows shared needs and shared uh, uh, desires, you, you, get a, you get a very different kind of response. And so we're starting to see that. And the tools we create give them that ability to engage and to see what they have in common. And it's a lot more than I think they, they ever realize. Alan, in, the, in Smart City Laguna and Smart City Natal and, and in the other ones that you have uh, currently deployed, you connect those services through uh, an app. Is that correct? Yes. So we have a platform is, is, uh, would be the correct definition. Uh, the platform essentially sits on cloud service provider. You know, we use AWS, Azure, like most companies do. So we're a platform, and on top of the platform, we run applications and, and services. Uh, the application we affectionately call Planet App um, is a set of application services and, and other uh, features that allow users to interact with each other, with the community, and with services that they they need in order to, to run their lives. Access so this could be a healthcare, transportation. Healthcare, transportation, yeah. Food buying um, and, and, and sharing, you know, uh, right. things, for instance, uh, how often do you use a hammer in your home? Once a year, twice a year, maybe. You know, do you own a hammer? You probably do. But when you're uh, living sort of paycheck to paycheck, a hammer that might only cost two euro or five euro or whatever, okay, it's not much money, but why am I buying it to use only once or twice? So we build, we call it a library of things, a library of tools, like a library of books. Come in and check out a tool, use it, check it back in. So we can reduce some of the stress of those types of purchases and another way to engage people. So, so it's not just about you know, engaging with the city, it's even engaging with each other, creating sets of shared services. Now, who monitors such a, a thing? Well, maybe one of the community members, right? It's a community association. So here's one of our community volunteers that can monitor and make sure things are tidy and put back properly. Uh, the, the football pitch. Okay, so you want to come out and play. That, that's great. But who pays for the maintenance? You know, right. how do we, what, what about if I want to create a tournament? I, I want to engage people. Come out, you know, let's, let's have a football match. Let's, let's create teams. Let's have some fun. Right? So you build some I, flexibility in the platform so for yeah. people to engage together. So we can no, engage you know. together. We can put apps out there and features. We can let them communicate, collect, uh, right. connect to each other. Uh, the, the pandemic, right? You're not supposed to leave. Okay, but I still need food. Okay, you're allowed to go to the grocery store. Uh, but there's some compromised people. You know, Should they be going to the grocery store? Is there a way we can help them? Right. Again, community engagement, bringing people together allowing them to work out these issues. We don't have to solve it for them. They know how to solve it. They just need the tools to make that happen. So the platform provides those kinds of tools. And then the infrastructure, where appropriate, we put in some smart you know, sensors, actuators, and other types of technology that can work in concert with this uh, digital platform for things that you know, might make sense, like security. In India, you can't build a community without a security gate. It's quite standard. Okay, so I can put a person there, but how do I know I should, you know, give entry to the right person? Oh, well, my uh, resident could just put in the information. It generates a QR code. The QR code is sent to the guest. The guest comes up, puts a QR code on the uh, reader. The gate opens. The security guard says, oh, you've been authorized. No problem. Just come on in. 
things like this, you know, really allow the community to build on some of their own needs as a platform. We can provide these tools linked together with a smart infrastructure. Who do you typically engage with? Is it uh, a current city that's thinking about developing its assets or is it um, a new city that's being created? Where do you start? We are a private company and we want to essentially build smart, affordable communities and sell them to people who need them. Um, when you start working a lot with government and uh, different regulations and policies, it can get kind of messy and it can kind of mess up the scale and the processes we've put in place that allow us to do something that our competition has, has struggled to do. So for us, it's about finding the right land in the right areas with the right kinds of conditions and then allow us to do what we do best. And so that's kind of the, the deal we work out with governments. We're not looking for a handout. We're not looking for subsidies. We're not looking for special uh, programs that allow us to build. What we're looking for is the ability to buy the land at a fair market price, uh, to be able to infrastructure the land at the quality level that we believe is necessary. Of course, following local regulations on you know, uh, homologation, electric, water, all those sorts of things, of course. Um, and then we want to build and sell, just like any commercial company selling a commercial product to a, a buyer. Uh, so for us, it's really about understanding the market conditions, working with government to see where the areas are, but ultimately making it a commercial transaction. And why? Why? Because we believe government subsidies and government support for affordable housing should go to the people. Let us be the commercial entity we are, let us focus on the right product for that community and let government help that community acquire, purchase, and engage in these kinds of communities. So for us, that's how we look at that target market. And the only other point I, I would like to make is in most places in the world, by definition, the people who need this kind of housing already feel marginalized. They already feel kept that they're kept out of the economic successes. Brazil has a growing economy. Why do people feel they're not you know, being part of that? India, even in the United States, huge swaths of land. As the country continues to grow its GDP, people feel less and less rich. People are becoming marginalized or being locked out. What we're trying to do is change that paradigm to some extent. We can't give them money. We can't make them rich. But we can create an environment where they feel safe secure and where they can feel they're included and can participate in the economics and social impact of their community. And I think we can do that in a, in a way that brings efficiency and scale that can connect them not just within their community in isolation, but allow that community to connect to the greater uh, you know, municipality and, and, and countryside that, that they're a part of. And by doing that, we hope that we can reduce some of that marginalization, make them feel more secure in who they are and what they're doing, and actually connect them to you know, the growing uh, global economy that is largely data-driven, you know, digital technology uh, type economy. It's not just about saying, bring Amazon and Uber and any other platform, you know, they're already digitally efficient. No, it's about recognizing their unique needs and considerations working with them to build the kinds of platforms that make sense and uh, aligning with them in that future direction in a way that works for them and, and, uh, and is unique to their, to their circumstance. Alan Marcus, Digital Officer for Planet Smart City. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Pierre. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Smart and Sustainable City podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe. Tell us what you think about this program at pierre.merles at partner360.net. If you're in charge of a smart city project or would like to share your view about your city, do reach out. We want to hear from you. <music>